take your Bibles and go to John chapter 20. I want to go to John chapter 20 and verse 21. And I want to read us a verse before we get into the thought for the night. John chapter 20 and verse 21. Thank you, choir. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Brother Sammy. Um, thank you. I, I've enjoyed the day. Amen. And uh, Genesis chapter, Genesis, John, I've enjoyed it so much, I don't even know what book I'm in. John chapter 20 and verse number 21. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. And I want you to notice this phrase because this is going to be very important for all of us tonight. Peace be unto you as my Father hath sent me. Even so send I you. So as my Father, to the same degree he sent me, to the same path he sent me, to the same thing that I faced. Is it hot? Okay, I thought it was just me. Man, I'm sitting up here going, I am sweating half to death. And I thought, maybe it's, okay, crank it down Brother Paul, Brother Robert, crank her down all the way. Keep fanning, and I'm good with that. Doesn't bother me one bit. If you need to take off your coat, your shoes, your socks, your wig, and uh, uh, Brother Martinez isn't here tonight, so we'll be okay. Uh, but I want you to notice it says here, even as. And we still have a lot of living to do before we see him. Did y'all hear that? We got, we got a lot of days to walk. And each of us, are going to experience the even as, as the Lord has sent us, as he sent him. We are the same. We're walking in these footsteps. He did not leave us without information. And I think that if you and I are going to make it in this world, we have to glean information from the Lord. And so let's pray, and then we'll get into the text. We're going to stay there in the book of John for the evening. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you of what a, a cliff notes this was, these few chapters in my life spiritually. And Lord, sometimes when we are going through what we're getting ready to talk about, it is easy to pull up on the side of the road and it's easy to go, I am not quite sure I want to do this anymore. Help me to be an encouragement to the dear people tonight through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go to John chapter 16, back up to John chapter 16. And in John chapter 16, he's, he's telling us here, and if we're going to pick up in verse number 16, he's telling them a, a little while. John 16, 16, a little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. This little while that they would be absent from each other, he picks up and keeps talking about in verse number 17. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is it that he saith unto us, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father? They said, therefore, What is it that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto him, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while? And ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, and, and I want you to notice that this little while right here, I want, you to, I want you to focus in on this, this little while. He said, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament this little while. During this time that I am no longer with you, during this time that I will be taken away from you, you need to know that emotions are going to erupt, ye will lament and mourn, the world's going to rejoice. Ye are, shall be sorrowful, but I want you to notice what it says, your sorrow shall be turned into joy. There's a phrase found in verse number 21 that is a very significant phrase that we need to look at, and it is found in verse 21. So now he takes this little while, and he says, Can we, let's liken it to a birth, right? So verse 21, a woman when she is in travail has sorrow, look at this, because her hour is come. I have that bolded and highlighted in my notes because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy. And, and ladies, I'm sorry, but it's what the word says, and I must preach the word for the joy that a man is brought into the world. 
and my mama would say this to that, yeah, but you couldn't come into this world without us women. <sighs> Never argue with mama, amen? And I'm just kidding about the man part. And ye know therefore, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you, and in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto ye have asked have ye asked nothing in my name? Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Long before that this was ever on the docket to preach, it was in my quiet time. And, and as I was studying this verse, and I came to this phrase, because her hour has come. This was in reference to that hour or, or hour or that period of time that when a lady, and we've all seen this happen, that the, 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 the lady is, looks like she's getting ready to pop and, and uh, have a baby, and maybe that was too crude, but now she's getting ready to have a baby, and, and we know her hour has come. Well, we, we know that it's going to be this period of time that's going to involve pain, it's going to involve, involve travail, it's going to involve birthing and then is going to involve a baby and then the bible tells us that this joy what jesus is telling them is this he is saying that as soon as this hour this period of time that when this for this lady is over the sorrow of pain is replaced with the joy of a baby the reason Jesus used this illustration of the woman giving birth is because he wanted the disciples to get ready. He wanted them to get ready for what was about to happen in his life. He said to them, mine hour is come. The reason he did this in the middle of everything because he wanted them to understand we're here. It is now. We are getting ready to give birth. We have had difficulties up to this point. We have had good times up to this point. We have fed the 5,000 up to this point. You have seen me walk on water up to this point. But you need to know that we are here and it now is the hour. Look at John chapter 16 and verse number 32. Look what he says there in verse number 32. Now we're in the middle of this discourse, all right? It starts in John 13, which we're going to go there in just a moment, and it ends in John 17. And you're going to find out he's right in the middle of it, John 16, 32. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be what, please? Scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have what, please? Tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Go to John chapter 17 and verse number 1. In John chapter 17, he now is in the middle of the Lord's prayer. The Lord's prayer is not our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's the model prayer. The Lord's prayer is found in John chapter 17. And look at what he said to the Father in John 17. At the end of this discourse, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, look what he says. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. He knew that what was about to happen in chapter 18 was going to be betrayal, and from there, there would be this series of events. And let's just confine the sermon to this. There would be these series of events that would be likened to a woman giving birth. He said, just like a lady goes through travail, her hour is come. Guys, I'm telling you, we're here, and it is now. And I'm getting ready to go through a series of events, but I promise you, there comes a break point when your sorrow will be turned to joy, but the hour's now. He started this entire discourse in John 13. Would you go back there, please? In John chapter 13, and you will find this phrase over and over again. In John chapter 13, and I will tell you that to me, this kind of sermon tonight is just not a filler. I find it so indicative of God 
that he sets the truth up long before we ever arrive at a week. But I want you to notice what he said in John 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew that his what? Hour was come. That he should depart out of this world. This is how he spoke over and over again. He he tried to tell them, look, it's coming. And at 13 he said, it's coming. You need to know that this hour that's going to happen, you need to know that mine hour is come. We now are entering into that travail. We now are entering into this fact of betrayal and travail and everybody's going to forsake me and everybody's going to leave me. And this hour that he spent, this period of time that he spent, would you travel back to John chapter 2 and verse number 4? In John chapter 2 and verse number 4, this hour, this period of time is what I want to talk about tonight to encourage all of us. In John chapter 2 and verse number 4, you're going to find the phraseology again. Look at John chapter 2 and look at verse number 4. Talking about turning the water into wine. He has been baptized. This is his first miracle coming out. And I want you to notice the verbiage here is the same as the verbiage in John chapter 13. 11 chapters down the road. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine, what please? Hour is not yet come. What was he saying here? What he was saying with this, Mary, mama, woman, and again, don't call your mama woman. But you know what he was saying to her? I know that they have no more wine for the feast. I know that they now are at the end. I know that they now, everything's depleted. And now the party's over. But this is not mine hour to take something that was empty and bring joy. Because my hour is not going to be defined by a miracle of turning water into wine. You see, we we play with concepts in the Bible, and we play with verbiage in the Bible when we all must back up and understand. When he talked about the hour, he said, woman, what have I to do? Mine hour is not yet come. Do not put me in a position to where I'm going to take something that is sorrowful and down to the bottom of the barrel, and then I'm going to bring joy out of that. The ultimate joy is not in this hour. The ultimate joy is when I resurrect from the tomb After mine hour is come. If you have a red letter edition Bible, how many have red letters in your Bible? If you will do something very insightful, if you'll look at John chapter 13. I have several red letter Bibles. John chapter 13. In fact, the one that I'm preaching from, my preaching Bibles. Is it not amazing in John chapter 13 that if you'll just look, it's it's half and half red, right? John chapter 14 The majority is red. These are the words Jesus is speaking. All of it's God's word, but these have been highlighted. Look at John chapter 15. All of it is red. John chapter 16. Some of it is black. All of it is, the majority of it's red. And John chapter 17, the majority of it's red. Jesus is such a wonderful God that he does not leave us without preparation For that hour. You see, he did not say, my hour is come. So it does not read this way. If you could take your Bibles, please. And if you could go to John chapter 13, if you're there. And John chapter 13, kind of hold your place in verse verse number. And uh, in verse number 13, chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having put now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's, uh, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hand, that he was come from God and went to God, and riseth from the supper, and layeth aside his garment, took a towel, and girded himself, and he poured water into a basin. Look at verse 7. Then answered and said unto him, What I do 
thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. Then Peter comes on and he tells him, wash me everything that I have. Look at verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And then if you'll go to John chapter 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples out of the brook, over the brick Kidron, in, 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 where was a garden into which he entered, and Judas also which betrayed I want to come to you and just let you know, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. All those that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall what, please, what's the Bible tell us? Shall suffer persecution. Would you please go with me to Galatians chapter 4. The birthing process is amazing. The Lord likens our new birth to the birthing process. And by the way, we are the recipients of the new birth that cost us nothing. Did y'all hear that? You, you and I are alive right now. Mama did all the work. Mama went through all the pain. We did nothing. But look at what Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, and, and here's what I, want, what I want to focus in on. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 17, then we're going to return to John. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that they might affect you, but it is a good, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. Look at verse number 19, because he said this, my little children of whom I, what please, travail in what? Birth again until what? Christ be formed in you. From here to there, I wish I could tell you that everything's going to be roses, but it won't. I wish I could tell you everything's going to go your way, but it won't. As he walked, we walk. As he experienced, we experience. And you need to know that there will be segments in your life, please let me encourage you as your pastor, there will be segments in your life where you will say, the hour is come. It's been a good ride up to this point, but the hour's here. Every member that ever comes out looking more like Christ, every member who's ever walked the glorified, resurrected life has had to go through that hour that defined them. It, it was that period of time. It, it just wasn't taking water and turning it into wine. That's not the hour. It, it's not the difficulty of a, a bad 20 minutes and you got over it with goodness. It's not that kind of hour. It, it, it's not the beginning of, well, I just had a bad day and let me take a nap and I'll be okay. We're not talking about moments that can be overcome. We are talking about you have entered into this hour, this hour to where all of a sudden it's not going to go well. It's not going well. It's the hour of betrayal. It is the hour of things going wrong. It's this time period that it seems like the enemy's winning and it seems like you've been forsaken and it seems like you're all alone and it seems like you're sweating great drops of blood. Jesus did not leave his, his disciples and the people that he loved without a game plan for that hour. He said the hour. And can I tell you this? We are still in the middle of that hour. We are still in the little while because he came back to them. They saw the resurrected Lord. You and I have not seen the resurrected Lord, and we're still waiting to see him burst through that eastern sky and come get us out of this place. But please know this, that he did something wonderful in chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, and chapter 17. Out of these chapters, I pulled over 50 stepping stones for Bob Gray II of how do you deal in the middle of that hour. You won't make it without a game plan from God. And I'm going to pull out just a little bit of this, and I want to give it to you. Would you go to John chapter 13 and look at verse number 5? How do you make it when you're going through that kind of hour? 
And I, again, will say this with all the due respect, that I am amazed at how God lines up a sermon with people's lives. And my admiration right now for some of the members of our church is huge. And I'm going to tell you why. Because our lives are not defined when we're feeding the 5,000. Our lives are not defined when we've got 12 basketfuls walking around. Our lives are not defined when all of a sudden a, a man's raised from the dead or the leopards are healed or everything's good. Our lives are defined when we go through that hour and who are we what are we made of when we enter into the garden of betrayal and we enter into where man is going to betray us and this is not looking good and it doesn't look like we're going to win and it doesn't look like everything's stacked against us and nobody's around us we're down to 12 we're down to one now we're on the cross now we're in a tomb now we're the three days it doesn't look good and it's this hour that christ said let me show you the footprint of who to be in that hour. Would you look at verse number five? And I gleaned a lot of things personally from this, these chapters. But would you look at verse number five? And he, that poureth water into the basin. And after, and after that, he poureth water into the basin. Remember, he said in verse number one, the hour was come that he should depart out of this world. He's entering into this hour, this time period. But look what he does. Would you look at his beginning? Verse 5, and after that he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. When you're going into the hour, can I tell you, first of all, keep serving people. Keep serving people. Do not sideline yourself and do not think that all of a sudden that you're going to make it through this hour because you are going to make it through this hour by this, getting back up and grab the towel and grab the basin and start serving people. Do not become the victim, become the victor. Do not let that hour cause you to sit down and cry and weep because after all, in three chapters I'm going through betrayal and in three chapters I'm going to be led away and arrested and in three chapters I am just, no, 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 please don't play the victim card when the hour is come. When all of a sudden you step into it, we're here, it's now. This is about as bad as it's going to get upon our whole journey. This is it. I will tell you that the best piece of advice I have ever been given as a pastor is, Bob, regardless of what's going on in your personal life, there still is a sermon that needs to be preached, and there still is something that needs to be done, and you cannot sideline yourself. You cannot check out just because it's your hour. And that's why my admiration for many of you, something happened a couple weeks ago that fired me up. Then I started weeping and praying. For, for some of our members, and it was like, somebody needs to champion this cause. Somebody needs to mount a, a stallion and just take out. But I will tell you this. When the hour comes, and all of a sudden, the people who are in the middle of the hour keep serving. And nobody knows. As your pastor, I stand here, and I say to myself, Wow, these are good Christians. These are good Christians. I didn't line the sermon up for tonight. The Lord put it on the calendar, and I've told you a hundred times, I'm five to six weeks out of what's going to be preached. But I want to say, you have been an inspiration to your pastor. Because even when you're going through it, and there's probably eight situations right now in this church and I never speak this way. But thank you that in your hour, you didn't stop serving and loving people. Our Lord left us the footprint. And I will tell you that as long as we stick close to the Savior, He said, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. And if he made it to the resurrection, then let's get him behind his coattails and let's just follow him through his hour and then let's act like he did in our hour. Go to John 13, 31. And, and honestly, we're not going to be long, so put your shoes back on. 
John 13, verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. Remember, it's coming in chapter 18. We're getting ready. We're in the middle of this hour. It's going to... It's bad. It's getting bad. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. Verse 33, you shall seek me as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, look at verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye, what please, love one another. And I love this phrase. He qualifies the love. As I have, what please, loved you. That ye also love one another. And look at verse number 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If what? Ye what? Love one another. If you're going through that hour. If you are going through that time to where, Pastor, we're not talking about something little, we're talking about something big, and I will tell you, it doesn't get much bigger than what Christ went through. The second thing I would like to tell you out of the 50 things that God spoke to my heart about is this, love. Love. He said, this is a new commandment I give to you. How can it be new? Here's how it could be new, because they had never been loved that way. That's why it was new. You know why it was new? Because they were like Peter. Peter, like, Master, could I ask you a question? How many times do I got to forgive this guy? Like, seven times? You know what the Lord said? No, 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 no. You have to forgive him seven times 70. You see, their love had an end. Master, I went my mile. I did the duty that I was supposed to do. You know what he said? Oh, no, 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 no. That's not how I love. You know how I love? I not only go the mile, but I go the second mile. (laughs) You know what he said? No, 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 no. We just don't love by giving them our coat. We give them our other coat also. No, no, no. We don't love by we turn the other cheek. He said, this is the new way to love. And I will tell you that when you're going through that hour and you think it's all caving in around you, don't stop serving others. Don't stop playing in the orchestra. Don't stop singing in the choir. Don't stop serving other people because it's this that Jesus said at the height of of his hour, and when he was entering into his hour and through the entire thing, he always cared about other people. And then he said, love. You're going to have to pull a page from the Lord's playbook during that hour, and you're going to have to stop operate, start operating by the new commandment. Verse chapter 14, if you would, and I'm quickly going through it, chapter 14. And I would encourage everybody here that this week, please take John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and I want you to tear these chapters apart in your quiet time and in your reading and find out how did he deal with his hour. Some of you are, it's here, it's now, it's never been this bad. Some of you, it's good right now, but it may turn out to be bad later. Pull it. Learn it, become it, and act like Christ. Look at John chapter 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. I'm in verse number 15. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. You see, when he was getting ready to leave, the next thing I want to tell you is this. Get a good relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. Did y'all hear that? Stop making the Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead that is of no factor in your life. He's a factor in your life. The Holy Spirit is sealed on the inside of you if you're saved until the day of redemption. And that Holy Spirit has been there and it is there to help you in your hour. 
You see, when you can't get a hold of anybody and nobody's going to understand and you feel like everybody's forsaken you and left, it is the Holy Spirit that will guide you. And he is our comforter. He is our paraclete. He is the one that walks beside us. And this may not mean anything to some of you right now. And, 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 and I'm sorry if I'm wasting anybody's time, but I will tell you this, that when you get to that hour, you don't want to blow it in that hour. You don't want to make the hour that is bad and make it worse. And how do I just survive if I can just get on the other side of the three days, if I can just get the tomb opened, if it just breaks for me? Listen to me. You are a child of God. Your sorrow will be turned to joy. But it's during this hour that you're going to need somebody more than your spouse. It is during this hour you're going to need somebody more than your pastor. It is during this hour you're going to need somebody more than your children. You're going to need the Holy Spirit of God to where you in your garden of Gethsemane can talk to the Trinity and say, we need to talk. The hour when this hour was come, Jesus said, my hour is come in chapter 13. And then he beautifully put out all these things. Look at John chapter 15. Not only keep serving, not only keep loving, not only have a close relationship with the Holy Spirit, but look at John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. That's the most misused verse in the, in the Bible, I think, at times. Look at verse 3. Now ye are clean through the what, please? Word which I have spoken to you, John 15, 3. Look at John 15, 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in me. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Do you know there is something wonderful about his words abiding in you? The next thing I'm going to tell you is this. Keep a close relationship with that book right there. When your hours come, this is not the time to binge the world. When the hour has come, this is not the time to narcotic your emotions with the fantasies of this world. This is not the time you dive into Hollywood to where you lose yourself in somebody else's life and you cry about somebody else's dog dying and somebody else's thing going wrong. This is not when you climb into an author with a human mind to where they take you on their mind trip. This is not when you dive into a novel, and this is not when you lose yourself in artist and singing. When you're in the hour, this is when you go to the only one that is the right husbandman and the right vine so that you can have the right purging. I'm begging all of us. I use this by permission, and I'm very careful, and I, and I know that a lot of times people will sometimes go, yeah, I use this by permission, and, but it's very sacred to me. One of our families that were going through it this past week, and I called them, and I said, look, are you okay? Everything okay? I said, what are you doing right now? And the church member said, Pastor, right now, I'm just staring out the window because I'm so numb. And I said, tell me what's, what do you have on the TV? What do you have on your phone? What's, what's, what, what are the, what's the ambience around you? And they said, I know you and think I'm weird, but I am so numb right now that the only thing I could do was turn on Alexander Scorby and he now is reading me through the genealogies. I said, you must be numb if you're going through the genealogies. I said, Pastor, that's the only thing I know to do. And I said, church member, and I won't give the gender, I said, church member, you pick the best thing you could do. 
get close to his word. When it is your hour, do not think that what you're looking for will be found in the emotional hype of man, and it won't be found in the works of man. It will be found in that book right there. And if you are in that hour, saturate yourself with the Word. Saturate yourself with the Holy Spirit. Saturate yourself by loving. Saturate yourself by just serving. Saturate yourself because the hour is come. And then if you would, and I'll end with this, look at John chapter 17. And look at verse number 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Do you know when the hour was come? Do you know what Jesus was in? Prayer. Prayer. Part of that list that, that helped somebody in that hour that God gave me personally is found in John chapter 17. Because I am telling you, there is such comfort from knowing when I'm in that hour, I don't even know who I am. I don't even know where to turn. I don't even know how this is going to turn out. The Lord does. The birthing process was the same as that hour. Because Jesus said, that hour... When that hour has come for a lady that's getting ready to give birth, there's travail, there's pain, there's sorrow. This is exactly what happened and what will happen with my hour. And ladies and gentlemen, you'll have your hour too. Children, do you know why you have been blessed with great parents? It's because they made it through their hour. My mom was getting ready to home, go home with the Lord, and uh, us kids were gathered around, and we were reminiscing about some tough times, tough times. My sister Kimberly had cleared out uh, mom's belongings and mom's things, and, and uh, all the grandkids got Bibles from mom. Mom, all of her Bibles we gave to all the grandkids, and RG has a Bible of, of, of geese and and, uh, and the other day, it was sitting in Kelly's car, and I had to clean out Kelly's car, get something from Kelly's car, and there was my mom's Bible. And, and I thought to myself, I haven't even taken the time to really look through the Bible to see what, I, I just didn't even take time to look through the Bible. Well, each of the Bibles that were given to the grandkids were, were um, a year specific to their year. It was amazing. So we, we were able to give the grandkids, with, with Deanna being the oldest grandchild, it was year specific. Well, our G's was given to him, and the, and the years that he has this Bible is right there at 9293. And, and I found it very interesting with my mom's notes in her Bible concerning our G and concerning this hour. Our backs were against the wall. I tried to play He-Man during this time, and I tried to beat my chest against the system, and uh, I was not about to take a handout. I was not about, I'm going to do this. The bills started racking. They started just climbing. The first several years of RG's life, we had racked up well into over $500,000 worth of bills, and, and I'm in my young 20s, and I'm like, no. I'm not taking a handout. I'll work till the day is done to get this thing done. And uh, my dad had to tell me, son, do you know why we pay taxes? We pay taxes to take care of this, these kind of people in our society. And I was like, I don't care what kind of taxes you pay. I'm going to get it done myself. He said, you're an idiot, and this is why your daddy and your granddaddy have paid taxes. We live in the greatest nation on earth when it comes to special needs people because these surgeries are care it's crazy and by the way it's not going to get any better either but i will tell you that in my mama's prayers
for her son. There were a couple of verses of healing that were in the Gospels. And my mom charted that healing. And she would write something out beside of it concerning Bobby. Let me tell you something. When that hour is there, you feel like you're not going to make it. But I praise God for a set of parents that when they were in their hour, they kept serving and they kept loving and they stayed close to the book and they stayed close to the Holy Spirit of God and they stayed close because they knew it's coming to an end and we're going to be just fine. I will tell you, if you are in your hour, you're going to be just fine. But when you're in it, stay very close behind Jesus Christ. Thank you for taking the time to watch one of our services here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And I would love to be a blessing to you. My number's at the bottom of the screen. And if you need anything, I would love to be of help any way I can. Again, thanks for watching. I hope the sermon was a blessing to you. And we will see you next time.